everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, back to Singapore and speak at uh, SEMS. Um, it's always a pleasure to come back to Singapore. Um, I've spoken at the other uh, conference a couple of times. This is much better. <laughs> much better. Um, so I've been asked to speak to you about um, improving the quality of uh, trauma care. And I've been around some of your hospitals this week speaking to people and uh, some of you will have seen uh, some of uh, what I'm about to talk about uh, already. But essentially, uh, I'm going to talk to you about what it means um, to be good at looking after infant patients uh, and what it takes. And all of you essentially have signed up to come here to learn and Roel talked about um, you know, how you're improving your own education and becoming more and more responsible for your own education in this day and age. Um, and you know, part of the reason for being educated is because you're interested and you want to learn more about a subject or a disease. Part of the reason is because you want to feel less out of depth when you're in a situation like this. Part of it is that you want to just do good by your patients and be the best uh, that you can when a patient uh, needs your help comes in. But what I want to put to you today is that it really doesn't matter how good each one of you gets individually. It's not enough. It's okay if you're looking after someone who's got an acute asthma attack. You can do that on your own. It's okay to look after someone who's fallen over and sprained their wrist. You can do that on your own. But as somebody's complexity of disease increases and the number of people who are going to be involved in their care increases, then things begin to get out of the control of you as an individual. And now you don't have to just have to be excellent yourself. Everybody around you has to be excellent. And it doesn't matter how excellent you are if the person who came before you or the person who's working beside you or the person who's working after you is not excellent. Because with all the best will in the world, all your good work, all your attempts to do good work will be undone. So how do you work in an environment where perhaps not everyone around you is excellent? Or rather, how do you make everyone around you excellent? How do you ensure the best possible experience for the patient in front of you from the moment that they're injured right the way through to the moment that they go back to work? And you may feel that it's not your business. You may feel that you only exist in the little slice of time that you're responsible for the patient. When a patient is presented to you, you do your job and then you leave. But if you're not responsible for the whole thing, then who is responsible for the whole thing? And if you're not responsible and don't take some responsibility for working outside of your own boundaries, and if nobody else does, then perhaps care will never improve uh, in your institution. So what I want to talk to you about today is how a hospital changes, how it does things. Uh, this is the Royal London Hospital. Um, so I don't know the but this big blue thing is our new hospital, which we moved into a couple of years ago. Um, and this is the old hospital here, um, which was started in 1740. This is uh, one of the older pictures before we moved in. You still see the helicopter on, uh, on that old uh, helicopter. So we see about 2,000 trauma patients uh, a year, about 600 of which uh, are severely injured. And I want to essentially describe to you the journey that we've been on as a trauma centre in learning what it means to be a trauma centre that looks after patients. Since we became unofficially a trauma centre back in the 80s, and then how that translated into actually improving care. <coughs> And then how that translated into developing a system that was bigger than us, a system for London. <coughs> and how we can demonstrate the effectiveness of that. And perhaps
perhaps as you're doing that, as I'm doing that, you can be thinking about which parts of this apply to your practice as an individual, to your practice as a department, to your hospital, uh, to your part of Singapore and Singapore uh, as a whole, and then actually to the wider uh, area that um, you service with your, with your partners. So this is the old frontage of the hospitals, um, built in 1740. Um, lots of people whose names are attributed to things um, used to work uh, in this place like Joseph Trees and Florence Nightingale, uh, etc. So it's been around for a, a while. And in the hospital charter in 1740, it says, if you want to come into our hospital, um, you have to pay and you have to have a letter from the government to say that you can pay. Um, unless you've been injured, in which case we will look after you for free. It's the first hospital in the country, essentially, that had the care of injured people written into its charter. And since then, it's had a commitment to trauma care, and that culminated in 1988 with us being designated as a pilot trauma centre. We got a helipad, we got a helicopter, lots of interested people came, worked there, we developed a big trauma team, we had lots of individuals who came but they were very good at trauma care with all that data. here. Um, we had a CT scanner in the emergency department um, very early on. Lots of interested surgeons, plastic trauma surgeons, or orthopedic trauma surgeons, general trauma surgeons came to work there. An ICU that had specialist intensivists uh, in intensive care medicine. And uh, you know, at any one time, 70% of our beds would be full of uh, trauma patients. And we called, because we had all these specialties, we called ourselves a trauma centre. Uh, you know, to be a trauma centre meant that you had lots of specialties and somebody brought you trauma patients and you looked after them according to ACLS principles and therefore you were a trauma centre and that was uh, excellent. We thought uh, that we were pretty excellent. Um, until we actually looked at what our mortality uh, was. And our mortality wasn't excellent. Our mortality was pretty average. Uh, what's more, um, if you look at the, the graphs, so the black bars are critically injured patients, the white bars are um, severely injured patients. You could track that all the way back to 1980 and you wouldn't see much difference in, in the outcomes uh, there. The black line hadn't really made much of a difference at all having all these, these people um, there. So we were a hospital of specialties, but we were not a specialty hospital. We were not functioning uh, as a trauma centre during that period. And actually, if you look at the UK as a whole, things were no better. On average, the most critically injured patients was about 40% higher in the UK than it was in the US. And this has been recognised for a while. Lots of reports have been written by a Royal College of Surgeons who think nothing has uh, been done about it. Um, and this is one paper that was, uh, you know, academic papers were published that showed that really, in, after ATLS came in, there had been almost no improvement in care. So there was some reduction in the chances of death as ATLS came in, and it just flatlined uh, after So we thought we were doing well. We called ourselves trauma centres set us up at school centres, um, but actually we weren't doing really much better. And in the meantime, the mortality from injuries was rising in the UK. Our roads are pretty safe, we're a pretty safe country, much like Singapore is, but the chances of dying if you got injured and you were severely injured were increasing year on year, and they are everywhere in the world, partly because the population is getting older, partly because the complexity of disease and comorbidity is um, worse. So trauma is becoming a more prevalent, more um, severe disease compared to all other diseases, cancer, cardiovascular disease, malaria, HIV, which is becoming less prevalent and less severe. So it's a big problem uh, worldwide. Finally, there was this paper published um, from an independent charity, the National Confidential Inquiry on Perioperative Death, which looks at every patient who was admitted to the UK with a severe injury over three months, and somebody externally went to the notice and said, yes, this care was okay, or no, this care was not okay. And of all the patients they looked at, 
only about 60% of patients had, well, sorry, 40% of patients had what would be considered to be adequate care. 60% of them was either a clinical problem or an organisation problem or both. Or quite frankly, care that was so bad that it had to be referred back to the medical director of the hospital. This is young children bleeding out of CT scanners, people being delayed to go to surgery, people not having their open traction covered for 48 hours. Um, uh, through to, okay, it's not too bad, but really you could do better, and this has actually impacted on either morbidity or mortality. So we need a different way of doing things, and we need to go back to a public health model of what is a disease and how do we look after disease. And looking after disease means you take responsibility for an injured patient population. It doesn't matter where it happens, it doesn't matter how it happens, but it's no longer just the patient who's in front of you. It's we're going to look after trauma patients. We are in West Singapore. We will look after this population of patients and ensure that they have both good injury prevention and good uh, injury care and good rehabilitation. In order to do that, we need to identify those patients in whom in, the injury is so severe that the benefit of going to a major trauma centre is present. So some patients who have isolated femur fractures, rib fractures, isolated skin injury, can look up the anyway. But there's a group of patients who have severe injuries that benefit both from the death and disability point of view and going to the main trauma So you need a good, effective pre hospital system that provides good pre hospital care but also does good pre hospital triage to prioritise patients and select where they're going to go. In the UK now we split places into major trauma centres and trauma units to do that, but triage is inaccurate. Sometimes people turn up at local centres, so you need ways of rapidly moving people through the system, be it between hospitals or actually inside your And then you need a way out of the system. You need to have good, strong rehabilitation and a seamless linkage to rehabilitation that probably starts on the ICU in the hospital and moves out quickly. If you don't provide good rehabilitation, you may save life, but that life may not be worth living. But also, if your hospital gets blocked up, the patients can't move out of the system um, because they're um, unable to move out of their beds and they need to, to rehab. And the whole thing in a public health model of disease is surrounded by a performance improvement framework that assesses how are we doing. What is our mortality? What are our outcomes? What are our processes of care? What new policies do we need to put in place to get better? Let's put them in place and let's see how we're doing again. So it's an audit cycle, essentially, but it's a very robust audit cycle. So, how did we get into this at London Hospital? Well, we recognised that our mortalities weren't so great. Uh, and we did a good lot of audits. We followed patients. 24 hours a day, a team of nurses and doctors and medical students had a matrix of what was good care, what was okay care, and what was inadequate care. And for a month, they followed 28 patients from admission right the way through to discharge uh, from the hospital. Those 28 patients had 2,200 variances from what was considered to be good care. Now, this is a dedicated trauma center operating at what we thought was a relatively high level and what most people would consider to be a relatively high level. But there were delays in people getting into scan, there were delays in people getting into surgery, there were arguments about whose patient it was on the ICU, was it a max patient or a neuro patient. So we finished our operation, it's not ours anymore. He was going to order the chest x-ray on the ward to see whether the patient's got a pneumonia. Who's going to write the discharge orders for a patient? So all of these things catalog into very poor patient experience, very poor patient outcomes, uh, and actually over 200 of those are considered to be life or death variations. So we took this report to the management and said we'd like to publish this, and they said you're not going to publish that, <laughs> but we will give you some resource to change. <laughs> So these were the big factors that came out okay, uh, of this study. Uh, and 
And I guarantee each one of the, you will recognize these in your own uh, hospital. It's really just a great letter of thank you. In my school, and they exist in every <coughs> hospital. Multiple teams looking after the patient, no one taking over all responsibility for the patient. Junior decision makers with a variable presence of consultants from various specialties. Patients all over the hospital under different teams. Uh, and you know, it's well known that if a patient is not on your board in a hospital, then you have to go and see an outline. You don't get to them until late in the afternoon. You don't, um, you don't get as good care as if they were your team. And if they're all over the place, then it becomes very difficult. Poor communication between teams. It goes facial fixation one day and maybe plastic surgery the next day because the two teams can't talk to each other. As the patient gets started twice, you know, we've found the Delays in the team. Poor communication throughout, poor discharge planning, and poor working with rehab teams to uh, put rehab um, plans in place. For. So we restructured. We restructured how we did things in the trauma uh, team, and we restructured in the hospital into a trauma service that would advocate for the patient, and that everyone came in and was under the trauma service, no matter how you were, you were injured. It didn't matter how you arrived, you came in, met by the trauma team. If you were admitted, you came in under the trauma service. And the trauma service would look after you, no matter what your injuries, no matter what your psychological needs, psychiatric needs, uh, until you were discharged to hospital to rehab, no matter what you're doing. And we put this audit cycle in place. And by far and away, throughout the world, the one thing that makes a difference to trauma care uh, and to the care of any complex disease, actually, a strong performance improvement program. So we have eminent every two weeks, every death and serious disability is discussed just like you discuss patients at your MNN. But this isn't an ED MNN or an orthopedic MNN or a general surgery MNN. This is a hospital wide MNN that's open to everybody. And every patient is categorized as to whether the uh, death or disability was preventable or not preventable. What the actual problems were. So here, this patient had a leg diagnosis of compartment syndrome. Um, the patient had was repeatedly cancelled, going to the theatre because they were being accepted. And then when they did have fasciotomy, um, they uh, were incomplete fascia. So we do this for every case, and we see exactly what the problems were. And then each one of those problems is addressed at a senior consultant level peer review committee, where only consultants go and it's the job to make change happen. Uh, and so each case is taken to a peer review committee, an action made, and that action must be closed off, closed off by all. So, this is what the UK looks like after we restructured, very quickly after we restructured. We have achieved more than a rates equivalent to uh, an average in, in other US uh, or Australian system in places where there are organised systems uh, of healthcare. And whereas we've been flat year on year up to 2002, we began to see a year on year reduction uh, in mortality uh, from these cases. And we, to say that it wasn't anything yet going on in the UK in general, uh, we compared ourselves to using our national trauma database to other big academic hospitals, the Grey Bars, and other community hospitals, the White Bars. You see that there's no difference between the big university hospitals and the uh, general hospitals here. We are more fancy the third than others. Not because we had any fancy drug, not because we had any fancy technique, just because we had taken variation and error out of the system. And you can look at isolated things like pelvic fractures through a shock and show decreases everywhere. And even for patients who have been transferred in from outside, we saw reductions in the mortality. And because we were discharge planning better, because we were dealing with complications better, our length of stay, our patient satisfaction came down, and most importantly, our preventable death rate was severely percent. So whereas in nearly one in ten patients, their death was deemed preventable by us, by us, beforehand. Now, essentially, it had gone to one percent, and most of those were pretty much the This is a very quick change in a very short period of time. By people working together, Across teams, across disciplines, to make it more than just yourself, more than just your, your team. 
So we rapidly put these reports and our experience into a London-wide process. There was a, a legislative process through this framework for action through Energy Month, which transmitted what we had learned to the city as a whole. Trauma networks were designated using the performance framework uh, and uh, reorganization of trauma stroke and target death and the board at the same time. So now London works like this, we're in four quadrants. We're here, we look after the network of 15 uh, smaller hospitals. There's still quite big hospitals, um, but they're, they're designated as trauma units and we're the major trauma centre. We drain a population of about 3 million uh, people and there are three other centres uh, here. So we went live in April 2010 and essentially everyone's modelling on the same system. But it wasn't like we had done everything that we needed to do either. We had a lot of work to do to ramp ourselves up to meet this performance framework as well. Lots of new policies, lots of new thinking, uh, especially stuff around rehabilitation. We had to as soon as the system came in, and this is six months before the London Trauma System, and each six months after, we had a suddenly a set increase in the number of patients that we saw. These patients have been sitting in outlier hospitals not able to access us before. But despite a 20% increase in the number of patients, we had an immediate decrease again in our mortality uh, from, from the severely injured patients. So again, a decrease in mortality. And that's partly a volume effect that you begin to see when it starts to get up to another number. So not only have we improved the overall quality of care by working outside your hospital walls with your pre-hospital care providers and your partner hospitals in the indoor region, people who are next to you, people who are with different resources and expertise, suddenly you can improve the access to the care. So 1,300 paramedics were trained in the London triage tool, identifying when they should find our hospitals to come straight to us, when they should take patients locally. And we saw a rapid jump in the number of patients and this paper from Jana in 2001 shows the effect of volume <laughs> just seeing enough trauma patients that you get experience over and above the effect of taking care out of the system there's a volume effect of, of having uh, enough patients to keep you busy I suppose so we were around about here before the system reorganisation and then we moved up to about 550 and about 600 so just getting to the stage we are beginning to see an extra approximately 20% reduction in mortality due to a high volume of them. So everyone saw an increase. King's College, the Royal Islands, and George, but everyone saw an increase in, in outcome, and everyone very rapidly saw an increase in their processes of moving. So this is our time for CT before 2009 and after the introduction of the service. And we were pretty static because we had a we had a very short time to see you already, 30 minutes <coughs> from arrival. Uh, this is in our normal hospital, it's now about 20 minutes from the new hospital. But the other major trauma centres haven't been acting in the same way and had to learn a lot and reconfigure a lot more than we did. They were running at about one and a half hours over one thing, uh, to CT and very rapidly came down to an hour and much less to people with they were So you can very quickly take what's been learned elsewhere and leapfrog to a new level. And we now get these dashboards sent to us from the National Service every week to say where we are compared to every other major trauma centre in the country and things like how quickly we get people to CT, how quickly we, we cover open contractions of the tibia, how many patients get tranexamic acid, uh, etc. And these things come through to us straight. So all that takes
and we need to bring our whole of us to the room. It's not enough just to look after the door to door. <coughs> so, how did we do that compared to how we were doing? Just to remember, there's the um, poor outcome, there's only 40% of patients having good practice before, uh, beforehand. We repeated this study last year for London, again from February to April. We had almost the same team of reviewers reviewing the notes of every indication in London the same. How did we do? Uh, so this is the evaluation of London tool system study, which uh, should be published soon. But essentially, the number of patients receiving good care jumped up to nearly 70% overall. Big differences, especially in room for organisational improvement and the less than satisfactory to the work of the That was tracked directly to things like differences in how quickly patients got to CT. So before it's all over the place, now almost everyone gets a CT within uh, an hour of That's no mean feat for the number of trauma patients in the group. And that tracks directly to a reduced mortality. So literally within two years, the mortality <coughs> from trauma has almost come down to a third, exactly where we were when we were running a local trauma system. So an entire city, of 8 million people in the day, 15 million people, uh, sorry, 8 million people at night, 15 million people in the day has had their injury mortality reduced to a third purely by working together, making sure that we do government and making the error out of the system. So can you do it here? So I would say that you're in a prime position. Most of you are doing most of this already. You know, from where I see you walking uh, around the hospitals and speaking to people, you're well on the way and you've got great clinicians and great leadership. And a bit of uh, joined up system thinking supported by government and, uh, and healthcare and resources to pull it all together to easily start a very big changes for the whole region even beyond um, the city of but it's not the exciting need for a cottony, last ultrasound, sexy trauma care. This is karate kids, you know, before you do all the fancy stuff, you've got to sweep the floor. <laughs> and being good at trauma care is about being good at the basics and doing it well at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday and two o'clock at night on a Saturday. And you know that it would be exactly the same high level of care then as it was you know, when the professor was on, uh, you know, he never comes in at night. So anyone can do it, it's been done all over the world, but it takes effort, it takes this sort of effort. Thank you again for inviting me.